with me. We'll turn to Habakkuk, Habakkuk. And if you need a copy of the scriptures, there'll be one right there in front of you in the back of the pew. As I'm looking forward to getting back uh, here into Habakkuk and a great little book that we've been able to study and look into. And uh, I'm excited about getting into this uh, section tonight as we look at God's response here to Habakkuk's questioning and uh, uh, perplexity, as we described it, if you could put it that way. And so I hope you got an outline. If not, we'll have one of our ushers trying to make their way down the middle aisle with some extra ones uh, when we can find both the outlines and an usher. That would be great. Uh, and uh, so we'll get their attention and uh, get somebody down here. And uh, they're very busy out there keeping everything safe and protected for us. Amen. All right. Habakkuk, as we've already seen the first few verses here, uh, Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and following, we talked about how we described it as the Silence of God. If you need an outline, uh, Brother Ron's coming down the middle aisle. Just get his attention there. The silence of God or the perplexity initially, okay, the burden. Remember what that perplexity uh, or the concerned silence of God is over. It's the reality that in Israel there's much wickedness, transgression, that Israel is not doing what they ought to do. What God expected of them, what he had given them instructions through Moses and the uh, Ten Commandments and so forth, those things were not being adhered to. So Habakkuk is crying, hey, why? Why are the wicked prospering? Why are things like this in Israel? And uh, uh, we talked about how in that his struggles revealed a focus on emotion. We uh, temporary faltering, embracing his faith because of it. And uh, he didn't have that settled faith as we described it. You know, heaven seemed silent to him. And when s- uh, such is the case, faith keeps looking upward. Lack of faith causes us to look around like Peter walking on the water and took his eyes off God when life became unstable, when things don't seem to be going as you would expect or desire, boy, we take uh, faith uh, ought to cause us to keep looking to God, looking upward as we described it as such. Then we saw the recorded answer that, re, that Habakkuk received in verses 5 and following. We, we called it the statement by God or the plan of the prophet's God. And in this, it was an assurance, right? Uh, he said, don't worry, Habakkuk. I, I'm completely aware of what's happening in Israel. And uh, uh, unbeknownst to you, I'm working behind the scenes, beyond your knowledge and understanding. And we talked about how much we rejoice that our God is a God who works behind the scenes. Amen. And uh, he does things when we don't see it, when we... It's not obvious to us. He is working behind the scene. And uh, Romans 8, 28, all things together for our good and his glory. And so we're thankful for that. And he's reminding Habakkuk about that. And, and also, in addition, that he's saying, Habakkuk, I'm about to unleash something that is quite astonishing. Verse number 5 is where we saw that. And he alluded and said, you're, you're not even going to believe it. You will not believe, though I told you. And he's going to unleash the Babylonians, this tool, as we described it, the tool of God's judgment. You remember? The Babylonians referred to as the Chaldeans here in this passage. He's going to cause them to go across the land in judgment, in punishment of Israel for their sin and their wickedness, their rebellion against God. We, we described, or let me go back here, uh, we described that terror of that tool, and uh, God says they are bitter, hasty. We, we, we read through all these verses down through verse 11 and studied them, how he described them, and then the totality of the judgment. Uh, they were going to lose everything, it would seem. And certainly the promised land be carried away uh, into captivity and so forth. Now, sometimes when we, uh, and boy, it was exciting tonight to hear praises and the many answers to prayer. But, but I, I think of even in the, the case of Miss Jan uh, and, and when she was in the hospital, right? We were praying for many days that the Lord would give wisdom to find out exactly what was going on. And, and there's frustration at times. In they try something that didn't work and they thought they had it. Uh, boy, sometimes yeah, the answer that is given, just wait, maybe, or maybe it's a no, can be uh, to us not making any sense frustrating. And that's what it was for Habakkuk. That was not the answer that he wanted. This is not what he wanted to hear. And so as God answered, it reminded us and reminded Habakkuk that settled faith, a faith that's not wavering, a faith that is not uh, dependent upon everything being perfect in my life. And, you know, sadly, there are some Christians who only have strong faith when everything's perfect. You know how often everything's perfect? 0.01% of time. Right? I mean, it really is. I mean, life is not perfect, almost never, right? And so, my goodness, if your faith is only strong and settled and everything's hunky-dory, perfectly fine, you're going to have strong faith. 
Uh, no, we need to have settled faith. And no matter the winds and the waves that blow, the trials and the struggles and the challenges that come, no, our faith is settled. And it's settled on the fact that God's answer is the best answer. You know, sometimes I'm reminded how far we've come in parenting. <laughs> there used to be an old uh, TV show that entitled this, Father Knows Best. You know, I still, I, I find myself sometimes to be an anomaly. Because my kids, Ryan, even at three years old, sometimes I'll say, do something, he'll go, why? And my answer is, because I said so. Now listen, the world right now would say, oh, oh, oh. you need to explain perfectly well. No, 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 can I tell you, that is a perfect teaching tool, the reality that sometimes God just says so. Okay. And so within the home, God has established that hierarchy and, and uh, leadership and so forth. And, and, and my friend, children, obey your parents. Because I said so in the Lord, for this is right. So understand, that is a great principle, and I'm not getting off track here. I'm just simply saying this. You know, reality is we've kind of gone culturally that just because God says it, what's the big, the, why does that, that doesn't settle. That, no, no, no. My friend, listen to me. God's answer is always the best answer. Whether we concur, we agree, whether we say, oh, yeah, we see it, or we see it, we understand why it is, my, uh, God's answer is always the best answer. Much like if mom and dad say to do it, you do it. <laughs> Because they said it. We said this, even though our hearts might say otherwise, our hearts might try to convince us otherwise. Then we looked at, last but not least, the thorough perplexity of the prophet. I love this because he's real. Okay, starting in verse 12, we saw this response, his head spinning. This is not the answer I wanted. You said you're going to destroy uh, Israel with an even more wicked nation. And remember verse 12, we don't have time to rehash it, but uh, it, was, it was so full of great doctrinal truth and theology about the character of God, the everlasting God. He is holy. He's the mighty God, a rock. He, is, he ordains things. It speaks of his sovereignty and his control over all things. And so we, we talked about that reality that it's a treasure trove in that sense but he appeals to that character of our god in a question he says listen this what you just said in these verses what the, the message you just gave me god is incompatible with what i know of your character in his mind and so we observe three things quickly the first was this the foretold judgment is incompatible with habakkuk's limited perception of god's character and we talked about how essentially too often we like in our limited view and understanding we want to dictate where and when and which one of god's characteristics should shine the most we want to tell God when he ought to operate in his love, when he ought to operate in his just nature, when he ought to operate in his holiness, when he ought to operate in his long-suffering, his mercy, when he ought to withhold it and, and to mete out judgment. We want to tell God when to do that. And Habakkuk was no different. I think of probably the greatest example of that was Jonah with Nineveh, right? He didn't want to go preach revival. Why? Because he knew God would have mercy. And he didn't want the God who was merciful. He wanted the God who was just in judgment. <laughs> That's what he wanted. And so he had a, a pity party. And boy, we can be like that sometimes. We want God to, we just want this one of his characteristics to shine the most. But we were reminded that we are not God. He is. We praise him for it because his way is best. My job is to live by faith in that truth. And so for Habakkuk, this answer didn't bring peace or relief. Rather, it deepened his perplexity. In verses 14 and 15, we saw the second one. This foretold judgment is incompatible with true compassion for the victims. He, he couldn't understand it. He's saying, God, you're going you're gonna to use this nation, this uncompassionate, cruel people, as your tool to mete out uh, punishment, chastening for Israel. And uh, he, he certainly, in his mind, didn't match up to the, what he perceived, the compassion, the People were deserving them. Number, um, uh, number three, the foretold judgment is incompatible with the undeserving conquerors. The focus here in the, the cruel Chaldeans. He goes on, we saw it there in verse 11. And again, we're just reviewing very quickly here. Uh, verse 10 and 11, uh, he says, listen, they're going to they're, they're gonna credit uh, their own worthless gods. You're the 
one. Nothing happens without you saying so, God. And yet, they're not going to praise you, give you the glory. Rather, they're going to offer sacrifices and praise their gods, the gods of Babylon. They're going to credit them for making them fat and plenteous, as the verse puts it here. Verse 17, excuse me, is where we're at there. And uh, they're going to give them credit. And the wicked Chaldeans, their success as the tool of God's judgment, he wrestled with it. How could that be? And so we learned that other important lesson, if we could put it this way. The just, as we see in chapter 2, verse 4, the just must live by a faith that is fully yielded and surrendered to God. His will, his way, the way he's going to do things, no matter the doubt spurred um, on by our view. We came to chapter 1 and verse 2, and uh, just about where we left off last time, if you remember, here was his final statement to God. He said this, I will stand, chapter 2, verse 1, upon my watch, and will set me upon the tower, will watch to see what he, speaking of God, will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. I love that anticipation. I probably spoke a little bit too much. (laughs) I probably questioned a little bit too much. And so God's going to reprove me. And so there's the prophet. He he has spoken his mind, and boy, he's he could have clearly been heavily reproved. There's no doubt in it, okay? But we love his attitude convey here. This is what we see is this. It's a spirit of alertness. He's waiting on God, that watchman that's just looking and waiting just to catch a glimpse of the answer that God's going to give. And he anticipated that God indeed would have the best answer. And we love this about Habakkuk. Though in sometimes that unsettled faith at times he questioned, he doubts, He still looks to God for the answer. And my friend, you'll never go wrong when you keep seeking God's face. And uh, as we alluded to earlier, boy, he has promised us that when we seek him, we will find him. And Habakkuk does that. And this is what I love, this next section. Um, uh, The reality is, as Habakkuk expected, God answered him. Look at verse 2, just the first phrase, if we can. It says this, and the Lord answered answered me may i just say this aren't you thankful tonight you see it on your outline there aren't you thankful tonight for the long-suffering nature of our god i mean uh, here he is and he's putting up with a back I keep coming back okay i gave you an answer you said why why am i letting this happen i gave you an answer now you don't like the answer and now you keep questioning me but no god comes back and man i sure am thankful i think in my own life i'm sure i'm thankful that god puts up with our questions that god puts up with our doubts that God puts up with our failures. That God puts up with our repeated pestering for help and wisdom and answers. Uh, bothering him in a sense. And yet, even more than that, man, I sure am thankful that our God doesn't just put up with it. He delights in it. You, you ever as a parent or a grandparent get tired of your grandchild or your child asking questions? Why is the sky blue? Why is this this? Why? <laughs> just stop! Stop! <laughs> Okay, I mean, you just, I mean, question after question. I mean, you know what? How many believers are here on earth and were hopefully constantly, constantly pestering God with questions and uh, crying for wisdom and help? And yet our God delights in that. He's long-suffering. Sure. In fact, if I could put it this way, he invites us repeatedly in the Scriptures to do what? Knock on his door any time. Man, I, I, you know what? There are times that I shut the door in my bedroom and I want a little peace and quiet. Then all of a sudden, I'm like, Erica, be quiet. Maybe they'll go away. No, not really. Uh, but, Dad, Mom, man, do, do you ever sleep? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Aren't you grateful that, that God says, ask, knock, seek, ask, and it shall be given you. Knock and it will be open unto you. Seek and you shall find. That's our God. Man, Habakkuk lives that out. He just keeps coming back. I don't understand this. I don't get it. I don't understand. And, and God's just going to be gracious. And we'll see that here very much so in this next part. I mean, it's, a, it's an encouraging response that he gives. And yet God says, call on me anytime. I, I ask for help anytime. And I just tell you what a great God we serve. He is kind and loving to us. Now let's see what he says. This is a great passage. Look at verse chapter or verse two of chapter two. He says this. The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end of it uh, shall speak. 
or excuse me, but at the end, it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Okay, now, great two verses. Let's start at the beginning. Okay, so we call this section from here on chapter to the end of chapter 2. Okay, we add to that statement in the silence of God, we, uh, the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God, or as we've gone with the alternative uh, outline, the prophecy of God. Okay, the prophecy of God. Uh, it's as in these first two verses, you know what God's saying to Habakkuk? I love that. Okay, Habakkuk, go and get your writing uh, materials. Go and get those tables, and I'm going to give you something. I want you to write this vision, this prophecy. I want you to write it plain and big for everyone to see and read. In fact, what has happened is we'll see as we study this chapter, this vision, this prophecy is the type of answer, response that's going to thrill Habakkuk's heart. And I'd put it this way. You know what we'll see by the end of this? And so often when God does answer and we understand what God answers, you know what it does? It turns our worrying into worship. That's what's going to happen with Habakkuk. God, why is the wicked prospering? Why is this? Now you're going to use the Babylonians. They're so wicked. And why are you using them? And boy, he comes to fully understand the revelation of God. God responds and answers him. And my friend, we get into chapter 3 and we see a Habakkuk that is just worshiping God. And my faith, that, uh, my friend, that's where settled faith comes in. It allows us and helps us to stop worrying about things and start worshiping the God that is in control of everything. He turns our worrying into worship. And Habakkuk's going to find that to be true. Now what I like about it too is that he says this is going to be a permanent record. I, I, I want you, this is going to be written upon wood and the stone tablet. This is going to be something that lasts for generations. You see, it wasn't going to be a vision like in that day that would be simply recorded on parchment as was customary in that day. No, this was going to be a vision. This was going to be uh, a prophecy that would last for several generations. And we'll see why in a moment. God was making it clear to Habakkuk, this is going to stand the test of time for some generations. Now you look at the last part of verse 1. When we read it, did you kind of think, well, what does that mean? Okay, That statement there, and I think I have it up here, yeah, that he may run that readeth it. Okay, Kind of interesting statement. What does that mean? Well, there, there's probably three primary uh, uh, interpretations that are taken of that. Some say that it refers to a messenger transporting and, and sharing the vision. In other words, uh, a messenger that would run like a herald of days of old that would go from city to city and, and share it. And so so the idea here is that when he wrote that, that it would be plain, written plainly, simply, so that the man, uh, a messenger could take it and convey the message clearly. And so he'd go from city to city and so forth, sharing it with the whole nation. Some others believe that it refers to uh, a vision of prophecy being written so plainly Okay, as written so plainly that even someone who was uh, running by, that in doing so they could immediately um, understand what it meant. They can, in other words, just running by, they immediately it would be clear to them. Okay, yeah, that that's what the prophecy is saying. If you want to think about it in a modern context, it would be the idea of a billboard. Okay, and uh, isn't it frustrating when driving down the road you only catch half of a billboard? Boy, that's frustrating. You know, what does it say? What the rest of us say? What, what, you know, so the idea here, some believe, is that the idea is it, it conveys the message very clearly, very quickly. And so that someone running by may be able to understand it and comprehend it. Short, concise, gets the message across loud and clear. Then finally, some believe, and I would probably lean towards this, that the idea is the one, that the one who reads it uh, runs away with joy and excitement to tell others, to share it. Okay, uh, the idea that the one who read it can run. In other words, he, he, he's, this is going to thrill him. And so it is. We're going to see what happens. And if I could just give you a, a um, uh, kind of, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, flip ahead to the last chapter of the book. Essentially what it is, is God's going to judge the Babylonians and deliver Israel, is what this prophecy is now going to say. Okay, so we'll get to that here in uh, a couple of weeks as it plays out in this passage. But the reality is this. He's saying, listen, someone's going to be able to read that. And because, man, you ever read good news and you want to share it with somebody? 
somebody would hurry up and go tell them. And so that's the idea, the picture here. And I would certainly lean uh, towards that likely being the interpretation, though I think others are, are certainly possible. And I can just imagine God leading Habakkuk as he takes down the prophecy, this vision. He leads him to, to, to put it on the tables or, or of stone or of wood and probably leads Habakkuk to make copies of it and puts it in the market of every major city in Israel. And uh, just to convey and communicate this message, to write it plainly, to make it big so everybody can catch it and understand and gain hope from it. But there's also, and I, I think this is important for us not to miss tonight, there's also a personal message for Habakkuk wrapped up in here. Okay? All the questioning, all the doubting of Habakkuk that you and I sometimes share in our own life. What is God doing through this trial, this challenge, this situation that we ask? Why is God allowing that to happen? Why do the wicked prosper in our nation and other places? Why? And we have those same things. Well, there's a message here when we are tempted to complain and question God's plan and his way. That message for, for back, we would put it this, and um, uh, it's simply woe to the prophet and all that would question God's way. Okay, whoa, like you would say to a horse, whoa, okay, hey, hey, hang on, whoa, whoa, slow down, okay, or to your children, and they're getting overly excited and getting ahead of you somewhere or something, whoa, whoa, uh, well, and he's saying that to Habakkuk here, he really is, as he starts this prophecy, and uh, he, he's giving us a lesson on his own timetable, He's telling us and reminding us simply, hold on, Habakkuk, just hang on. Don't jump to conclusions. Just stop right there. Let me explain. Whoa, Habakkuk, stop jumping the gun, okay? It's a message of great deliverance for them, destructions for their enemies. But what he's saying, especially in this uh, verse number three, this message isn't for right now. It's for the future. It speaks of a time to come. That's why he said, I want you to write this on tables. I, I want it to last from generation because it, it may be some years before this this prophecy comes to fulfillment, that this prophecy actually shows up to be fulfilled, if we could describe it that way. And he reminds him that God's calendar is much bigger than ours. God's calendar is much bigger than ours. Habakkuk wanted God to operate according to his calendar. So God, uh, you know what? I'm open next Tuesday, so let's, let's deal with the Babylonians then. And God said, eh, hang on, whoa. I've got it all under control. Now, isn't it interesting? Sometimes you and I have all the answers to our prayers worked out. God, if you could answer this by this date and in this way, and everything would be great. God, you answer prayer to my calendar. <laughs> you work out, you deal with them according to my calendar. And uh, we are reminded often and need to uh, be reminded that God's calendar is much bigger than ours. And may I tell you this, and I love what he says in verse number three, catch the significance of the word. On God's calendars, there are appointments just like there are on my calendar, your calendar. His appointments, though, it means this. There is an appointed time for everything. He's going to appoint it. There's an appointed time. I love how he states that. And uh, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. On his calendar, it's when he decides that it ordains that it will be, it's an appointed time. And for things to happen, when that time comes, the vision, this prophecy, and did you catch what he says? I love it in verse number three. There's a lot here. He says at the end of it, when it comes to fruition, it shall speak, right? And it shall not lie. That's a great statement saying this. You're going to find out that everything I've told you in this prophecy will be 100% correct. You remember the Old Testament test? To see if a prophet was of God. If everything the prophet said came true, he was of God. If something failed, he was not of God. 100% accuracy. Now, I don't know much in our human realm that would match that type of <laughs> needed accuracy. Amen? 100%. And so God is saying here, listen, when this, when this prophecy comes to fruition, when it's fulfilled, whoo, it's going it, it's to prove it. It will speak for itself. It is not a lie. You'll see it play out, and those who are around at that time will do so. And I love all that. He says all of it will come to pass just as the vision lays it out for you to see. And then he points out this, that it, though it tarry, you need to wait for it. Okay, Though it tarry. Wait for it. Wait for God's plan to work. Wait for God's plan to play out. 
Boy, we're reminded of this in Scripture. So many have to learn that lesson. Sometimes you and I in our own lives have to, have to learn that lesson. That Boy, we can jump the gun. We can get ahead of God. I think of Abraham and Hagar. <laughs> and God said, I'm going to give you a promise. I'm going to give you things. And it didn't seem like he, in his mind it's not going to happen. And so he introduces Hagar. And boy, he just introduces a whole boatload of problems that last until today. We jump the gun. We get ahead of it. And so God's saying to Habakkuk, whoa, just hang on, Habakkuk. I, I, we're gonna, I'm going to operate according to my timetable. Let God's plan work. Then in the same verse, did you catch this? He seems to contradict himself. God does. He says, and we know that's not true. It's a seeming contradiction, right? He says, okay, though it tarry, you must wait for it. Wait on God. Then he says this, then it will not tarry. Catch that? Verse number three. No, wait a minute. Wait a second, God. You said it's going to tarry. Wait on it. And then you get down here at the end, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So we understand what's God saying here. Though it doesn't happen right now when you want it to occur, and it's going to seem delayed to you. It's going to happen. It won't. In other words, God prophesies and says this is going to happen. You can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. We've seen in the New Testament, well, people, Peter said people are going to come in the end times, and because Christ hasn't returned yet, well, Christ isn't coming back because he's taken too long, he's delayed, uh, it's not happening, and so that'll be their reasoning. And so I love it back here in Habakkuk, God is saying to everybody, listen, (laughs) though it tarries, you wait. So don't jump the gun and say, oh, man, we got to do something. No, 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 you wait on it. Then he also says, and then don't get to the point where you give up hope because it hasn't happened yet. It it will not tarry. It's going to happen. I love this statement, and I think we ought to take it to the heart tonight. You know what? Delay is only in the heart of man. The details of God's plan always occur according to God's perfect timing. The moment you and I are tempted in a certain situation we've prayed about and we've begged God for, and we're like, man, why does God delay? Step back, remind yourself, "Uh uh-oh, delay does not happen on God's timetable. It only happens in the heart of man. Because God's timetable, God's calendar, he has appointed times for everything perceived delay is only here or here in my estimation or perspective of god's doings his will and his way delay you see there is no delay with god there is only perfect timing i'd put it this way and i think this is something that can be of encouragement to you and i this evening god always has a purpose man needs patience and all will be perfect You see, we need to constantly remind ourselves that when prayers go unanswered, when the wicked prosper, (laughs) when things do not play out the way that I think they should, when trials don't go away, we need to remind ourselves of this simple truth. God has a purpose. Man needs patience. And all will be perfect. He has a purpose. Mankind needs to be patient. And everything will be perfect. Because that's what God has promised. Now we make it personal. You know, some of us need to write down this simple statement. Let, let's make it personal. I know some of you are trying to write it down, but here it is. Let's make it personal. Our daily reminder is this. God has a purpose. I need to show more patience, and all will soon be perfect. I need to show patience. God, I keep praying about this, and man, I'm, trying, I'm gonna jump the gun. I'm gonna try to work it out myself. No, I don't wanna do that. I need to show patience. God, I've been praying for this for months, for years, and it hasn't happened. Just have patience. I need to show patience. God has a purpose. I need to show patience, and all will soon be perfect. All things work together for good. Perfect. The perfect scenario, the the perfect alignment of everything is God's appointed time. Some of us need to write that down. When you and I are tempted to to doubt and question and complain about our current situation, we need to read it. We need to remind ourselves of this truth, and then we need to stop and pray and thank our Heavenly Father that He has a purpose for everything, that He will work things out perfectly. Now we want to move on to the meat of the, the vision, and just for a few moments we'll get into the very first verse of what I would call the main message. Look at verse 4, if you will, with me. Verse 4. Notice what it says. 
Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Okay, so he starts this out, and this is the encouragement of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, it's okay, man. My buddy, just settle down. It's, it's okay. I, I got it under control is really what he's saying in this verse, okay? And we know this to be the key verse, right? The, the just shall live by his faith, and that settled faith that we've been talking about. So this starts a series of woes. Okay, the different kind of woes. And so, uh, letter B, we're going to title this, The Woe uh, to the Perpetrators. There should be woes, really. Okay, Woe to the Perpetrators. We'll see at least six of them. You could say there's more. There's five that specifically use the word woe uh, that we'll get into this passage. But also here in verse number four is woe. So, woe to the perpetrators and all that would do likewise. Anybody who's going to be like him and, and go down this path, and we'll see what that means. Okay? Verse 4, you see it again, it says this, behold his soul. Now immediately, because of the context of where it happens or occurs in this passage, we might say, who's it talking about? Who's the his? His soul. Well, the verse itself doesn't tell us, but it becomes abundantly clear without argument from the rest that follows in the vision that the his soul is speaking of the Babylonian. The, Baba, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. This is who he's talking about, his soul uh, not being upright and so forth. Okay? It's you know, the soon-to-be conquering enemies of Israel. It, it, it's like God is saying to Habakkuk. You remember what Habakkuk said? Don't you know what these people are like? <laughs> they're cruel and they're mean. And God has already explained that he knows that. But he's like repeating to Habakkuk, do you really think that I don't know what the Chaldeans are like? That I don't know their heart? You know, often, you know, God has to remind us, hey, you look on the outside, I look on the heart. And I see the heart. He told Samuel, he reminded him, yeah, I, that's where I look. And so he, he gives us a great principle, universal principle. You know what it is? It's, it, it's pretty clear. We'd say we know it is this. The proud is not upright of heart. Okay? Th- that means, if we can put it this way, pride is not right. Just because someone is proudful and they seem to be established, they seem to be prospering, it doesn't make them right. And if I could, let me make it practical this way, okay? So who would be the last ones standing in a few short years, and depending on when we think that this prophecy was written, it could have been as soon as 15 to 20 years, the Chaldeans swept across that known land and Israel and other nations, and they were the last ones standing. All the other nations were were cowering in their shadow, uh, had been uh, defeated, carried away, killed. And so, so in a sense, we could say they were the last ones standing. The last one's upright in their stature, but God is saying, oh, they're not upright of heart. I know that. I, I see their heart. And you see, it's a good reminder practically of this. Now listen, the most powerful in the moment is not always the most righteous. The winner is not always the most righteous. The one who speaks last is not always the right one. The one who seems to prosper is not always the one who is right or good. The one whose soul is lifted up because they seem to be doing well and succeeding and better off than most is not always the one that is right. You see, would the Babylonians be the one that conquer uh, and sweep across the land, decimating both land and nations? Yes, but their heart isn't right. You know, it's human nature for us to look and say, uh, you, you think back to your childhood or maybe even dealing with your own children. You know, they can do something wrong, and, and this is the carnal flesh, the old nature. We do something wrong, and we think we got away with it. Therefore, it vindicates and makes me feel like I, I, I did right. I'm good. I'm righteous. Well, my friend, we know that <laughs> the pleasures of sin last for a season. Be sure your sin will find you out. We know the principle is a scripture, but man, our old flesh wants to believe, well, man, if I, can, if I can conquer someone else, I must be doing something right. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Well, it seems to be working, so I must be doing something right. That, that is in no way the estimation of whether someone is righteous or good. What is? The heart. The heart. 
And we know from scriptures that the heart of the Chaldeans and the Babylonians was not right. Nebuchadnezzar, one of their leaders in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, there on your outline, that verse, the king spake, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, and said, it's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Woo! Wow. Pretty prideful. And this was pretty much uh, typical of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, puffed up. God makes it clear they're not upright of heart. He's saying this, Habakkuk, don't be fooled. I'm not. I know that they aren't upright. I know they're prideful. Living on pride and being puffed up does not bring success in good things. In fact, God makes it clear to Habakkuk in this passage what Solomon recorded for us in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And God is supposed to, is about to, I should say, excuse me, is about to elaborate to Habakkuk. Listen, don't worry. The Babylonians will receive their recompense. They will be dealt with in a just manner, according to my timetable. My calendar, says God. The key here is not for you to think about it. Well, goodness, if, if the wicked are going to prosper, why don't we all be prideful and act like the wicked? Why don't we all act like the Chaldeans and the Babylonians? That is a foolish, ignorant, uneducated, faithless response. If the wicked are prospering, if they're doing all these things and seem to be getting away with it, boy, I, well, we should join them. What a terrible response. We should question. You know, the reality is this. <laughs> Our response should be to warn them because judgment cometh. They're not going to get away with it. You and I who know God and know the heart of God, the will of God, the way of God, we realize, whoa, whoa, whoa. Boy, you may get away with it for a moment. You may even prosper in doing wrong because you may be a tool like the Babylonians. But you can be sure your sin will find you out. God is the great account keeper. He is the one that will make all things right and perfect in his timing. But we know that. That's what faith says. And Habakkuk is struggling for a moment. Some of you have family members that aren't living for God and, and they aren't doing right and they seem to have everything goes their way. Everything falls into their lap. Everything is just hunky-dory for them. And here you are. You're trying to live for the Lord. You're trying to do right. And boy, I mean, you're buffeted on every side and things seem to be falling apart. And the devil loves to get in there and say, ha, ah, see, if you just be like them, if you'd give up on God, if you would just stop being so serious and sold out for God, you'd stop living for him and putting him first and seeking to please him, man, it would go much better for you. Can I tell you, that is a lie from the pit of hell. And God's reminding Habakkuk, Habakkuk, you know this. Get back to living by that settled faith. The just shall live by his faith, not his sight. You're seeing the wicked prosper. The Babylonians are going to sweep across. You think, my goodness, they're so wicked. They're terrible. Why are they succeeding? Don't live by sight. Live by faith. The just shall live by his faith. And what do we have faith in? Certainly our God, and we have faith in his word. Be sure your sin will find you out. He's being reminded, as we often have to be in the entire nation of the Babylonians, Chaldeans, what we'll read now and next Wednesday or so, we'll see in the rest of this chapter, Babylonians come to find out Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18 is true, just as Nebuchadnezzar found out personally. I love that passage in Daniel. Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, he looks around and says, ah, Babylon's great, Babylon's great, I'm great, I built it, this is wonderful. You remember verse 31, the very next verse? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. I, I, I don't know about you, but when I'm talking, I don't like to be interrupted. I'd hate it even worse if a voice from heaven interrupted me. That might just get your attention. A voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. Habakkuk, whoa. 
I have it under control. Woe to them. Unless they change their path, unless they turn to me, uh, woe. I might just put it this way, and I think this is a good reminder as we close this evening. It's this. You know, it is better to be the one that lives humbly by faith in the God who controls the calendar than to live in prideful confidence in the one who controls nothing. So much greater to live humbly, humble faith in the God who controls everything than to have faith in ourselves who we honestly control nothing. Live by faith in him. Whoa, Habakkuk, trust me. Live by that settled faith. And then he says, woe to those who are lifted up in pride, not of an upright heart, whether that's the Babylonians or others who choose to live in prideful confidence in oneself. We'll get back to chapter 2 here in verses 5 and following next week. And uh, appreciate you uh, listening. It's been a great study, and I hope you'll continue to enjoy it as I have. Let's